Hello friends and welcome back to my channel. I am Cher. If you are new here, if you wouldn't mind hitting like and subscribe, I appreciate the support. So we're going to hop right into it because this is a very long-winded episode and I'm so sorry about that, but I have so much information that I think is really good information I'm trying to pack all in. So this was going to be a part one and part two, but it is now going to probably turn into a part three as well. So this is the second part of our video series on how to grow your social media, basically. Everything about if you want to be an influencer or you're trying to grow your business. Um, I am sharing my tips and tricks on um, how I did it as a, now as a 10K influencer. I just hit the big 10K. So this is kind of in honor of that. Um, so my first video that I did, go check that out if you have not seen it. It is basically sharing my story and then also giving you some general growth principles across all platforms. Today though, the second video, we're going to be going into much more detail and we're gonna break it down by social media platform. Um, most people in my, I took a poll, did a poll in my stories on Instagram, which by the way, if you do not follow me there, I'm at Share Shares Beauty and that's where I just hit the big 10K. So go check me out there. Um, but anyway, I shared in my stories, you know, what's the most important platform to everybody. And it was not even a majority. It was unanimous, um, Instagram. So we're going to spend a lot of time on Instagram first, and then we're going to touch on some of the other social media platforms as well. I did have some interest, especially in Pinterest too. So, um, that's what today's episode is going to be all about is delving into each social media platform. And then in the third one, we are going to talk about monetizing and some, um, tips and tricks of how you monetize. All right. So I'm going to dig right in because so much to say, so little time. We're going to talk all about Instagram. This is probably the one I will spend the most time in. Okay. So if you had, say like you had a brand new brand spanking new Instagram page, um, some general principles on there, quality pictures and consistency of your filters. I will confess that I am not a great role model of this because um, my content has kind of evolved over time and I've experimented with different things. You do want to have kind of a consistent theme going on. You want to have a consistent layout, a consistent, um, you know, photo quality is big. There's a, an app called Planoly, P-L-A-N-O-L-Y, that helps you plan your Instagram content, but it does cost you. I think you can get so many turns for free, but I use the stuff so much that I ran my quota out <laughs> and can no longer use it unless I pay, and I'm super cheap and I never pay for anything. So I'll give you a little tip on how I plan my layout. I take a photo collage app that lets you do like a freestyle where you can just throw pictures in there and arrange them. And I take any of the pictures on my phone that I've taken and I lay them out on the page to look like my Instagram grid. And that is how I plan my content. But it's important to kind of have your branding and your style and your, your layout of what you want. Also make it very clear in your description and caption what your page is about. Um, what you're going to offer your audience. So as you're starting to post, really it's just important to understand how the Instagram algorithms work and they give the top attention, as I said, to those pages that are already established really that are getting like tons of comments, tons of likes, tons of shares, tons of saves. And I think the order it goes in right now, I think, I think shares, saves, comments, likes. I think it goes in that order of how the algorithm works. So Instagram really prioritizes when people share, share your stuff and when they save your stuff, that's really big. So, um, obviously you can't force people to do those things. How do you do that? Okay. Honestly, in the very beginning, I called on Uncle Joe, my best friend. But a downside of that is the way that Instagram does their algorithms too is they need to get a feel for like what kind of content you want to see um, and that you're gonna be giving out. And so they share 
other pages with you that are similar to friends you've made and content you're looking at. So if you want your stuff to show up on other people's pages, you want to make sure Instagram knows that you are a beauty niche, like for me, you know, I tried to make sure I instantly started following the beauty pages. I started interacting with the beauty pages. I commented on all of theirs. I liked all of theirs. So you start off in the niche you are going for, your audience, and you want to tell Instagram, this is who I want. These are the people I want. This is going to help them start putting your stuff on their feed too. So you've really got to be thinking about your niche audience. Um, so you can have a little bit of your family members and stuff on there commenting, but just keep in mind, you want to make sure you're getting that niche that you want going as well. Okay. So, um, you know, asking people for the support right up front. And of course, how else do you get engagement other than having really good content that makes people want to actually engage? And now this is what's tricky about it though is, okay, um, you might have a post that is really good and it looks nice and maybe you're a jewelry page and you want to show off your jewelry and you want to post your earrings, you know, and it might be like super cute earrings, but like, you know, you think about like, what do you do as a consumer? If you're scrolling through and you see, you know, a bunch of different posts on your Instagram, I mean, on your um, Explorer page, and you see cute stuff that you really like, um, and you might go look at it even because it's really cute, but are you always going to like and comment on it? No. I mean, you know, like I don't like and comment or I didn't used to before I started blogging. Now I do it because I like to show people support because I understand, but as a consumer, like 90% of the stuff I really like and would probably buy as a shopper, I'm not necessarily going to go take the time to comment on it and like it, you know, on a, on a social media page. I'm just going to like look at it and be like, oh, that's so cute to myself. You know what I mean? So, um, think about that from the consumer point of view. What are the types of things that would make somebody go comment? You know, if you start phrasing the caption in a way that asks them a question that's more interactive, that um, forces them to actually comment and say, oh, yeah, I would. Like, okay, if, if I wanted to show off my earrings and I said, um, I just posted a picture of them and said, these are for sale or whatever. Okay. Might not get a lot of attention or not, not a lot, might not get engagement. However, if I posted both the necklace and the earrings in the same post and I asked the question, which one is your favorite? You're bound to get more comments on that because people are going to be like, mm, I like the earrings better than the necklace. I think then the earrings are my favorite. They're bound to comment on it more. It may not be that one post was better than the other one, looked better or more talented or whatever. It just, it garnered that response and the conversation more. So always trying to pose your content in a way that's going to garner more conversation and engagement. Okay, another thing that you can do, um, and there's pros and cons of this as well, is you can join, you know, engagement threads. Um, there's all kinds of different types. The cons of it is, well, first of all, the work it takes to um, engage on everybody else's too, but also it's not authentic. Um, and, you know, later as brands are looking at you and they see the same people in the same comments over and over again that don't look authentic, it just, it doesn't look authentic, right? Um, but your idea with it is to beat the Instagram algorithm. You're trying to overcome Instagram's restrictions because the more engagement you get on your post, the more your stuff is going to get seen. So you got to find a way to trick them. I mean, that's just all there is to it. And then um, another con too is you do also have to be careful with those groups because Instagram does not like them and they see it as not authentic. And so um, if you, if they figure out that that's what you're doing, they could shut you down. They could ban your page. Um, so you want to always make sure you're not using trigger words and things that their bots pick up on. Okay, and so then also getting your stuff seen. Um, I am, 
I spent a lot of time on hashtag strategy and just really researching hashtags. So here's a few tips and maybe you're like, what are hashtags? I don't know. Or I mean, surely you're familiar with hashtags. It is basically the way that you search for things you're interested in on Instagram. They like somebody wants to search for, you know, beauty that's more geared towards the 40s plus crowd. They could go search for um, hashtags that relate to that. And then the, they find you that way. And as they're scrolling through all of the subjects on that matter, they might see your post and go look at it and you could possibly pick up a follower or get engagement from it, whatever. Okay, so I will just tell you like when I, since I spend so much time on hashtag strategy, um, Usually about half of my reach, like half of my, half of, half of the audience that sees my posts are from hashtags. Half of my stuff is getting seen by people not following me. Um, they're not even like on my page. And that's like a key to growing is you want all the people that are not already following you to follow you. So how do I do it? Um, you get 30 hashtags per post that Instagram will allow you. So you want to maximize that 30. You want for every post, you want to hit 30 hashtags. Um, and you want to pick them from the middle range. You don't want it to be a hashtag that's too small and you don't want it to be too big. If it's too small, nobody's going to see it. What is too small? In your hundreds. You don't want anything in the hundreds, okay? Just don't, just ignore hundreds. Um, what's too high? In the millions. You do not want in the millions because basically there's just so many people using that hashtag that your stuff's going to get buried. I mean, it'll literally be seen for about, it might not even be seen for a second. It's just, it's going to get buried. So you want something that's in the middle that's going to, that has enough people posting in it that it's a, a relevant topic a lot of people search for, um, but not so many people that you get so buried. So somewhere in the thousands, usually like, I try to opt for between like, 50 and 100,000, somewhere in there. So, um, and then I do a variety of hashtags. I don't use all the same types of hashtag. With each post, I use all different hashtags. I gear it towards whatever I'm posting about. And because I tend to post, I mean, I have a beauty page, but I also do a lot of style and I do um, product reviews. I do makeup looks. Sometimes I do things that are more lifestyle, you know? So whatever I'm posting about, I research what seems to be very popular hashtags on that particular post and subject I'm talking about. Um, I also always tag as many people as I can. Like, for example, if I'm doing a makeup look and I use certain products, I always tag those product, those brands. You know, if I did um, Anastasia Beverly Hills, I will tag their company. Um, so always using tags for as many things as you possibly can because anybody else that's looking at their stuff might see your content on their page. So just always keeping in mind tagging and hashtags as many as you possibly can think of that are like the most efficient strategy. And another tip on um, if you're coming at it from a monetization point of view, if you're wanting to get noticed by brands and you want to do some affiliate work, if you want to do some product reviews, you know, like I'm in the beauty niche, so I do a lot of product beauty product reviews. If you want to do that and you decide that, you know, that's something you'd like to do as part of your blogging, um, be thinking about like what are things that brands are looking at and, and approach your hashtag strategies that way too. Like sometimes I put the hashtag PR friendly, which means product review friendly or PR gifted if it was something that was gifted to me because brands sometimes are looking for like, who are people that are willing to do product reviews and I can go look at their page and see if they're a good fit for us. Um, so putting your, putting yourself out there that, Hey, I'm, I'm, um, I'm willing to accept the, this work. You can put it in your caption if you want, that you're PR friendly. Um, also, one thing that I do as well is if there is a particular brand I'd like to work with, I go look at what hashtags they are following and I try to suit my hashtags to fit there so that maybe I'll get picked up on the hashtags they're looking at and so they'll notice me. Okay, so we're going to talk about probably the most important tip of all. This is 
the absolute epitome of what I have established my blog on, and that is relationship building. It is all about relationships. Um, and this feeds in with like the engagement. It feeds in with everything really is you cannot build this without people. How I kind of started off, I'm going to share a few growth strategies with you, how I used, I don't want to say used people, but used relationships to grow. Um, okay, over on the special needs parenting side, I kind of started off with, you know, I used my hashtags, I did my content strategy, you name it, but I started going out and looking for those people who had autism blogs and diabetes blogs. I went and found my niche of people and I started just you know, I followed some of them. I started engaging on their stuff. Over time, they started seeing me being a consistent person that was always following and tracking them. And they eventually followed me back. Um, I would engage in people's stories. It was a little easier to do that in the special needs parenting side, because that's just such a special niche where we are so happy to find other parents going through what we're going through, that there's so much for us to talk about, that we... I think special needs parents are more inclined to follow each other and build those relationships than maybe in the beauty niche world. And um, I did find it was a little different tactic with the beauty world. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, another thing that I did, I would find big blog pages. For example, I have a couple of blogging friends that had an autism page. As I was commenting in their comments and on their feed, I started commenting on things other people had said on their page because they were all autism moms too. And of course, this was something I knew a lot about and I already wanted to connect with all these people anyway. But um, in doing so, I built relationships with their audience and they started following me as a result. Um, and so it just kind of naturally happened over time, but it took hours every day of just going out and being invested in other people and building those relationships. So um, this is a lesson you can kind of learn in anything you're doing is you've got to invest in people. You, you, you can't just be like, I'm going to post something and everybody's just going to follow me. You know, you get out there and you get in the trenches with everybody else and you show them that you relate and that you're there to provide that connection and, and valuable input too. Um, it was a little trickier in the beauty world because there's so many, you know, beauty folks and it's maybe not as, um, emotional as the parenting disability side is. So they're not as prone to just follow you back right away. Um, so some other tips on that, engaging with your explorer page a lot. It can be hard to get on people's explorer pages, but one trick is to go out and pull from your, your explorer page and comment on the stuff that you see on your explorer page. And that's more prone to get you on other people's explorer pages as well and get you seen more too. Um, but anyway, so some other tricks. Um, so one of the things I did start off doing early on was several like beauty loops, which is, um, it's kind of like follow for follows and it has its pros and cons. It's, um, it's good when you're first starting out and you have zero followers, um, because you can go out and it helps you to really find those, those people in your niche, um, the beauty niche. And of course you're automatically getting some follows back, but you don't want to build your whole blog on that because you want your audience to be truly authentic. And, um, some of those people in your beauty world are authentic because they're there for a reason too. And they're going to be just as interested in your stuff if it's in your niche. Right. But, um, just kind of keeping that balance in mind and also keep in mind that Instagram caps you out at 7,500 followers. So, I mean, it follows, you can't follow more than 7,500 people. So you can't build your whole blog on that. Other ways to sometimes, to get quick and easy followers, but I don't recommend this to be honest. I had to learn this the hard way too, is to do a bunch of giveaways. I think this used to work a lot more in the past, but things have really changed. Everybody follows you to get the prize and then they instantly unfollow you. So I cannot tell you how much money I spent on wasted giveaways. I do not suggest it as a growth attempt. It will look good for about a week. It'll give you instant like 
500 followers in one shot sometimes, but I guarantee you that within a couple months time, they will have all unfollowed you. You might get like three to stick, even within your niche. <laughs> and I did a ton of giveaways. So I would say if you want to do giveaways, this is on Instagram. Um, I can't speak for YouTube yet, but like on Instagram, if you want to do giveaways, do them out of the goodness of your heart because you want to give back, not because you're trying to grow. To be honest, there's also um, like the VIP loops, you know, when you can select the VIP slot or a ghost spot where you don't have to follow somebody back. Um, I mean, they can work, but they have the same problem as giveaways. Everybody just unfollows you instantly. Believe me, you never retain those. So you can keep spending your money if you want, but I'm just going to tell you right now, it is a straight up waste of money. Okay, so let's talk about your content strategy. Um, now, one thing that is IG's hot, hot, hot thing is reels. So you really want to focus on those because that's IG's big thing because they try to compete with TikTok. Um, so this is their equivalent to the TikTok videos. Um, and after you do a reel, Instagram is more likely to continue to promote your stuff. Give a lot of focus to reels. One of the biggest tips I can say with reels is it's all about the music you're using, which can be an issue too because Instagram can be funny about copyright. I don't understand why they provide certain music in reels for you to use and then they come back later and pull it and tell you they've blocked it because of a copyright issue. And also just thinking about within that first frame what's getting seen first by people because they're not really seeing the end of your reel they're seeing the very beginning so you want to think about how are you going to grab people's attention immediately in that that reel um what else as far as your content goes you know good pictures and so one thing i've just had to do is see on my own insights when you get like if you turn your um instagram page into a business page you can get all of your insights on posts. So it will show you all of your stats and what is doing well. That's really key is just always looking at your own content and the insights on them to know what's doing better and start gearing your content towards that. Okay, let's talk about Pinterest next because I did have um, a couple of people that were interested in growth tactics on Pinterest, how to optimize it. So I, um, used Pinterest, especially for my blog website. I have had a lot more success from that side than I have from using it to promote my other social media. Um, so some key things for Pinterest. Okay, probably the biggest thing with Pinterest is making sure that you optimize all of the keywords on there. So you want to have keywords both in your description about yourself, like your about me section up there, you want to have the keywords optimized in your boards. You want them optimized in your pins everywhere that you can. Okay, so always be thinking keywords. How do you figure out what are the keywords on Pinterest? Um, it's tricky. First of all, you want to think about how would you go search for something? Like I use Pinterest all the time, personally. I'm a huge Pinterest lover. I use it for everything. Um, so I kind of think of like, how would I go and just do a search for something I'm looking for? But sometimes things that you think are common sense, like the way that people would do it, is not what is optimized on Pinterest. So before you ever go put your keywords in, you want to go look and see actually type them in and look and see what hashtags and descriptions pop up and are more popular. And again, it's kicking it back to that like right size amount and the phrases that you see that are actually popping up for you in that category are the ones you want to use throughout. So you wanna set up even your boards with that in mind. You wanna label them with keywords. Um, and especially in your pin. So in your pin itself, not only do you want it to use some hashtags with those keywords, you want to use the actual keywords and the description of what your pin is about, both on the title of the pin and on the description of the pin. 
really, really huge because Pinterest is basically a search engine is what it is. Um, you don't even have to have any followers to be successful on Pinterest. It's all about optimizing your words in a way that when somebody types in a subject, your stuff is going to pop up. That is probably the biggest, biggest key. The second biggest key is when you're doing your pins, having the graphics set in a way that attracts people. Like that is huge. It's hard for me to explain in words <laughs> um, how to optimize your graphics, but you know, Pinterest is very visual. So that one's going to be um, the pins that are catching people's attention. So um, I'm going to show you some of my most successful pins that have gone viral and that have brought me the most traffic on my page. This is an example. <laughs> And one of the things you'll notice about it is very light and bright. So the more, um, I don't want to say have a white background, but, and this goes across all, honestly, on Instagram too, the, the more white a background and lighter the background you can have, the better sometimes. Those really attract attention a lot more. Um, but on your, your Pinterest graphics, you really want that very white, crisp, light and bright um, something that really just draws people in. It's all about your graphics. You can have a subject that's amazing, but if your graphics suck, you're going to get nothing on it. So, um, and also your picture. I have noticed, like I use a lot of stock photos for my pins, for my pin graphics, rather than my own photos a lot of times, because those stock photos, um, it's almost like they have something built into them that Pinterest picks up on and promotes faster. I don't know what it is, but, um, but they just do. I've noticed that a lot of mine that have done better have really good photography that came from stock photos that I used. You can find stock photos on Canva, canva.com. It's like the top graphic site that I use. Um, but anyway, you can go look for different graphics, um, you know, apps or websites or look for just, you know, go out and Google like stock photos and see what all is free and, or some you have to pay for. But a lot of times I will look for a stock photo that has to do with my subject. So the keys are really finding a good photo and a good background. Another key I have, I have learned is um, posing your pen like a question sometimes. For example, um, what was one that I did? Okay, I had like a makeup one that was on contouring and instead of just a basic, here's uh, contouring tricks, contouring tips and tricks or something, you know, that would sum up what your blog post is about. Instead of phrasing it that way, um, I took a key part of my blog post. There was like a paragraph where I was talking about the importance of looking at a person's undertone and to determine like what kind of contour colors they should be using. So I posed the question on the pin. I said, are you using the right undertone or the right skin tone, the right colors for your skin tone or something like that? And then I had a picture of um, like the foundation I was using or something. And that one blew up. And it's because it was relatable. People have that question. They want to know and it grabbed the attention a lot faster than just contouring tips and tricks, which is the same thing that everybody else uses to describe their blog post about contouring, you know? So phrasing things in a way that really grab people's attention. Um, so those are some, some of the top tips for going viral on Pinterest. Okay. Another tip too that I forgot about is, um, for every like blog post or every post or whatever it is you're trying to promote and get out there on Pinterest, um, you want to make like five to 10 graphics for that one thing. Very time consuming, takes a lot of time. And this is why I have, I've been letting my Pinterest go a little bit. I, I used to do a lot more on Pinterest when I was more doing the blogging website. And honestly, the majority of my traffic comes from Pinterest on my blog website. And it's because I spent a lot of time pinning and doing these graphics for all these, you know, for like a lot less writing than I did pinning. <laughs> I'll put it that way. So, um, 
the more pins you can do with different graphics and different styles for each post, the better. Because the way Pinterest sees it, you, if you keep regurgitating the same one, they see it as the same one. But if you have a new graphic, then they see that as a new one, even if it's the same website link that you're using. So they will put it out there more because they think it's a new fresh one. So that's just a tip. And using different photo stocks too, not just the same picture over and over again. So that is another tip. So one thing that helps a lot of um, bloggers to be able to pin more efficiently because it is so time consuming is they subscribe to something called Tailwind, but it does cost money. Um, and I just, again, I'm cheap and I have tried to do everything in a way that does not cost me any money and not put in financial investment. Um, so, that is an option though, if you know, you're really serious about wanting to grow your Pinterest or grow your blog post, it, Tailwind is a really good tool to look at. I've heard, I have not used it yet. Um, it's something I may use in the future, but um, everybody that I know that has used it says it is a fantastic tool and it is worth the money. Um, but that's if that's gonna be your investment and where you want to spend your time is on you know, Pinterest. <clears throat> it just, it helps do your pins automatically for you as opposed to having to manually pin so many. Um, so that's another resource to look into. Make a pin with your graphic and your keywords and descriptions and all of that, and then just link your website straight to where you want them to go to buy those products or what have you. And so that's really the trick with everything. Um, if you're pulling it from YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, shopping apps, Amazon, whatever, graphics, keyword optimization, make several pins for just that one thing and link the website to it. Pinterest is really a key for, especially for blogs. And if you can find a way to optimize it for your social media, definitely recommend it too. One other tip I forgot about is um, sharing group boards. So if you were to join a blogging group or you see like a, um, a beauty page or sorry, I keep saying beauty cause that's my niche, but whatever is in your niche, if you see somebody that's in your niche, you can invite them to collaborate on your boards. Um, or you can ask them if you could share a group board with them and that gets you more exposure. So when I was first starting off, I had a blog sharing group where we would share each other's blogs. I was on Twitter, but I'm not active there now at all. Um, so we did a, it was, the group was more on Twitter, um, but the person who coordinated it ended up making a Pinterest board where we could all share our blogs to this one general pot. And um, that really helped because then we would all repin each other's pins. So group boards are a big way to kind of get out there, especially if you found somebody who was already very established and had a lot circulating out there in your niche that you could connect with. But again, that's all about those relationships and networking and, um, you know, engaging with other people and finding the people um, is a whole trick in and of itself. Let's talk about TikTok real quick. Not a huge expert on TikTok yet. I have been able to grow some on there. Um, I'll just share what I do know. So I think I'm probably around like 3,000 right now followers, but I also follow 3,000. <laughs> a lot of it has been, one thing about TikTok is there's a lot more follow for follows. People are, people automatically just follow you back a lot of times. So a big key there. And the same thing I did with Twitter too, um, is really just go follow the people in your niche, find them, use hashtags to find them and searches and um, TikTok kind of starts to know what it is you want to see after a while when you search and they start giving them the, giving you those people and vice versa. They give you to others too. And it's the same principle. You want lots of engagement. I hear that it helps if you, sh if people share, like copy your link, that really helps get your stuff out there. And you really want people to view your videos for longer than just a snapshot too. So all those things help get your stuff up over the TikTok algorithm. Um, biggest key is music. 
trending music all the way and how you can find what's trending. I mean, you'll just see it out there and hear the songs over and over again, but um, you can actually go search under their hashtag section and type in trending music and it'll show you like what all is the top hits lately, like what's trending. And you can kind of study that and you can study trending sounds and um, they'll tell you like, here's the top music that's been going viral this week, you know? And so the more you can use those viral sounds, the better. Um, also, it's kind of the same principles again with the content, just what are the types of things that people are gonna catch people's eye like instantly. I've done such a hodgepodge of things on TikTok. I do, I don't do as much makeup on there. I've done just like, mostly I just have had time. Again, um, I tend to throw like makeup collapse we've done if it's already a video we've done for Instagram, I'll throw it on TikTok and throw music to it. Um, and I haven't had a lot of success with those. People are just like, whatever. People want to see funny, entertaining things on TikTok. They want that original fun stuff. So you got to think more in terms of being entertaining to people. They want to see something that's, you know, that's the kind of stuff that goes viral. Okay, I'm not going to talk much about Facebook because... I, Facebook is a beast I have not figured out. Facebook is just, I think people just use it for their personal use to stay in touch with their personal friends and family. Sometimes they follow pages of interest, but it's really, they don't use Facebook the way they do Instagram where you follow like niches of your interest. You use Facebook for personal stuff. Um, so Facebook is a wonderful place it, to especially draw people to links like YouTube links and blog links. So I wish that I could tell you how to grow your Facebook page and had told you I'd figured that one out, but I haven't. I have studied about it and I have not gotten any of the strategies that people have told me in the articles. It hasn't worked for me. So um, I don't really have a lot of tips for Facebook. You know, same principles again, you want engagement. One thing I know with, the, with Facebook, if you have, you know, business page or what have you that you're doing, if you don't get a lot of engagement on a post, you want to go ahead and delete it because no engagement, actually, it's almost like it subtracts from in the algorithms on Facebook. Like they almost take it into account in your statistics. Like if they see overall, you have a lot of like likes and engagement on stuff. They keep on promoting stuff as opposed to just one post. So if you have one that falls flat, get it off your page, get it off there. It's going to hurt your reach overall. So that's one tip I can tell you with Facebook. Um, most of mine fell flat. <laughs> so for that reason, I'm just not very active on my Facebook page. Um, so no, I just haven't figured it out. Um, I get basically my friends to go on and comment to help me with engagement. And I have a few, I have some people that are um, authentically engaged and but it's kind of rare. It's like on a special occasion. And I also have like my blogging groups where sometimes, you know, I mean, we support each other, but Facebook's just been for me. So I can't help you there. Um, okay. But we will talk about YouTube a little bit. Again, I told you that this one's kind of my least. I'm just still so new to YouTube. I can share what I've read and researched about YouTube and I can share what some has happened for some of my YouTube friends, what I've observed, but I can't really share as much from my personal experience. I can sh I mean, I've grown like a little bit, but you know, I'm still so new. I really, I'm not an expert on YouTube yet. Okay. Um, so YouTube, my tips for YouTube, really, I think one of my issues is I don't have time to make a lot of content and videos for you guys, you know? So, um, most people I've seen be successful at it are posting three times a week. They have a consistent YouTube schedule. People know what to expect. And it's just, you know, again, the more videos you put out, the more opportunities for people to see you and engage and get your watch time in. And that's something that's been a struggle for me. I'm kind of just all over the place. It's like whenever I can fit in a video and feel inspired, I do one. Um, but it's best if you can be consistent and give your viewers an idea of what to expect. Um, again, good, you know, keywords. Use every tag you can think of in the tagline. Um, 
and in your description. Uh, what else? Good graphic on your thumbnail so that it catches people's attention. Um, you know, all those same basic things we talked about on the others apply on YouTube as well. I am not sure if I know how to tell you how to grow other than the type of content you're doing, that it's something people really want to see, promoting it on your other social media to draw it to there, getting the keywords. Um, some other things I've discovered that not everybody knows about is really investing in shorts. And if you don't know what a short is, it is, um, it's kind of similar to a reel or a TikTok video. It's a very short, <laughs> short, <laughs> it's about 30 seconds long. You want it basically definitely under a minute and you always use the hashtag short in your title and in your, um, your hashtags in the description so that YouTube kind of puts it in the shorts beta mode. And these are things that YouTube kind of suggests to people too. Like I'll see other shorts up and it comes up almost like a story. And at first I thought it was a story on YouTube and I'm like, can you do stories on YouTube? What is this? But it's kind of like stories was on Instagram, you know, they, YouTube kind of pushes it more for people to see and it can bring in a lot more engagement and views than your regular videos. And so really make use of shorts. That's a good way to grow. It's a fairly recent thing they launched. Um, and a lot of people still don't even know what a short is. So that's one thing I really recommend is doing shorts in addition to your longer videos. And giveaways. I have still not done a YouTube video. I mean, a YouTube giveaway, and I am planning to do one. I just haven't yet. So I think giveaways are another great way to grow. Um, I can't speak to retention of followers as much on YouTube since I haven't done one, but from what I hear from my other YouTube friends, they all seem to have had success with giveaways and usually keep most of their followers. So I think Giveaways are better for YouTube than Instagram, is my impression. I could be wrong, but from what I am noticing. So I think giveaways and shorts are two really good tips for growth on YouTube. Okay, and I mentioned Twitter. Um, I did start off on Twitter too, just trying to promote my blog. And that was another good one, kind of like Facebook for just putting your link out there really quick. Um, I just don't use Twitter now. I would if I was still doing special needs side, I think. But because I'm less on the, um, I don't want to say, how do I say this? I feel like it was great for like writers and certain niches, but I don't feel like it's a great platform for every niche. And I just don't feel like it's the best one for beauty personally. So I've just kind of let my Twitter go. Um, but some strategies on there, again, I think you get three hashtags with each tweet is if I remember correctly. And again, it was just really optimizing your keywords and your hashtags. And I just went out and started following anybody in my niche. And a lot of times they'd follow back. Okay, and then there's a new um, app that's, I mean, fairly new. Some people have heard of it and some haven't. A new up and coming one called the Clubhouse. This is a really neat concept. And I think it kind of blew up and the, the nobody expected it to blow up kind of thing. So there's a few kinks but like one thing is it's only for iPhone users. Um, but it's kind of the idea of like a podcast, not podcast, but it's an audio room, an idea of audio rooms similar to podcasts, but you're there live in the room listening to a topic someone's speaking of and other people can contribute. And it's a really neat idea. Um, I'm on there, but I have not been very active. And it's not something where you directly link all your stuff and start like a blog on there, but it's a way, a great way to network and find people and bring them over to your other social media. So I just wanted to mention that one, that it could be a resource for you. Now it's invite only, but it's pretty easy to find an invite. Really, you just got to find somebody else who's on Clubhouse. Most of them usually have invites that Clubhouse gives them to give out to people and refer them to get them on. So you just got to go ask around basically to get on there, but it is a really neat thing. Um, they have all kinds of different topics. You can use it for business or you can use it just for personal. Um, any topic you want to know about, you just delve into it. Okay. And then I realized that I have not touched on the blog itself, the blog website. This is a whole beast also. Um, finding your domain 
getting your website set up. Like I could spend a whole YouTube video on all that. So I probably will leave that part out. Um, but basically I got set up on a WordPress. You want the one that's more on the business side that you can monetize on and get on a um, website domain that you own and set up your blog how you want it. And there's different plugins that you can use. I mean, I almost would have to show you a whole tutorial to spend time on that, but I just wanted to kind of give you like basics of, you know, the direction to go in. If you know nothing about website design, you may want to consider just hiring somebody to just build your website and be done with, with that. But then again, you do need a little knowledge of, of it in general, because you're going to need to update it ever so often. You're going to need to add things, excuse me, especially as you, um, have affiliates and want to monetize. So it's best to learn it yourself. But basically, you know, you're kind of starting there with your website. Um, and then to start promoting it, like I said, Pinterest is my number one traffic generator. But another, uh, another source of traffic comes from like Google websites, I mean, Google search engines. So getting recognized by Google, basically, which can take a lot of work. Um, especially having your SEO. They definitely call it SEO on the blogging side, search engine optimized, really having those keywords and how you find those. There's a plugin that you can use that shows you, um, I think it's Google. I can't remember now. <laughs> I'm going to look it up and attach it here too. Um, but that Google plugin gives you the um, SEO language that you would need. You can check to see how to completely optimize each time. I actually tried to put that plugin on my blog and it was above my pay grade and my dad's. So I have not done it. So I have not gotten legit with Google yet. Um, and that's part of why like Pinterest has been my main bread and butter with, from the blogging website standpoint, I would love to still do it again. It's just not a priority. <laughs> Since I'm only one person. Um, but that's, those are kind of the two big ways to make it big with blogging is to, um, you know, be featured on all the search engines and Pinterest and then using your social media, your other social media to promote it as well. So the best ones are usually Facebook and, um, Twitter, you know, because they can click on those links immediately. So if you're really coming from the um, blog website and that's what you want to focus on, I would recommend definitely Pinterest. You've got to know Pinterest. I mean, you just have to, but I would also recommend really trying to build a good Facebook page. Again, I can't help you with that. Like I said, <laughs> so um, those are two big sources of traffic to a blog website. And also finding ways to build a blog um, mailing list where you get people subscribed to your blog so that they just automatically see it. And a good way to build that list is offering them some kind of incentive to join your mailing list. A lot of people do it through the pop-ups on their website, um, but offering almost like if you have a helpful PDF or something that's like a freebie tool that you're giving out to someone that gives them a lot of incentive to go ahead and sign up for your blog, that's usually the best way to bring that traffic into your actual blog and get them subscribed. Um, so that's a lot of it with SEO optimization, really getting those keywords optimized. You want to have those keywords built into every single part of your, your blog post. You want it in the title, you want it in the subtitles, you want it in the first few words of your description, like your introduction opening up. You want those to be your top, like most priority words that people are going to bring in. So sometimes it's tricky when I'm trying to come up with a title for my blog post. I want it to summarize and grab people's attention and tell them what it's about. But at the same time, I've got to have it optimized for, for Google or for Pinterest or whatever. Um, but especially like Google and, you know, the internet, what's going to, prompt make put me at the top of the search engine if somebody searches for something so trying to figure out all those pieces of the puzzle can be really tricky that's probably the most important part of your um, blog layout is trying to get those keywords in there laid out and then you also want to build them into every picture um, 
behind every picture, you always label the keywords and the descriptions of the picture. Everywhere you can, you build those keywords in. Also getting backlinks is important. That helps you grow more, get more legit with, um, with Google as well. Um, another little tip that, that I started doing that really helped was now some of your themes already have this built in, but some of them don't. I would make sure that at the end of every blog post, I always added in, you know, for more topics like this, you might enjoy blah, blah, blah. And I would have like two other blog posts that were similar to that topic linked for them so that they'd automatically want to go click through to my next um, blog post. So that was another trick. And I had a lot of success with that because I usually, when I get like one person on my blog looking at something, I can see where they've clicked through to other pages. And that really builds your, um, your ranking with Google as well. That's something that that helps the stability of your website. Definitely build in those, um, those plugins that allow for sharing automatically on social media. So it's just one quick step people have to get it out there. Okay guys, so that wraps it up for today's video. Like I said, we are going to continue with um, part three because I just, we're already at like almost an hour and I just, I can't squeeze any more in, but I really want to touch on monetization because I know a lot of people had questions about that too. Um, so make sure that you stay tuned so that you don't miss a video three, but I hope, um, today was very helpful for you. Um, that about wraps it up. If you remember to hit like, and subscribe and the notification bell so you don't miss more like this in the future.